from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Hello, my name is Mary Lou Rieger, and on behalf of the Library of Congress's Office of Scholarly Programs and the Kluge Center, I want to welcome you to a lecture by Dr. Maria Teresa Ventura entitled Market Empire, the United States, the Philippines, and Natural Resource Management. Dr. Teresa Ventura came to the library on a fellowship sponsored by the American Council of Learned Societies and the Mellon Foundation. She received her MA and her PhD in history from, the universe, from Columbia University and was awarded the university's Bancroft Dissertation Prize. Dr. Ventura is now an assistant professor in the Department of History. Uh, history, can we do that one again? <laughs> okay, thank you. Dr. Ventura. And Dr. Ventura is now an assistant professor. Sorry, um, just pause for a moment, keep looking at the camera, and then try to take it again. Yeah. If you want to start from the top, too, that's better. Do you want me to do the whole thing again? Or? Yeah, yeah, you might as well. Okay. Okay. Hello, my name is Mary Lou Reeker, and on behalf of the Library of Congress's Office of Scholarly Programs and the Kluge Center, I want to welcome you to a lecture today by Dr. Maria. <laughs> yeah. Hello, my name is Hello, my name is Mary Lou Reeker, and on behalf of the library's Office of Scholarly Programs and the Kluge Center, I want to welcome you to a lecture by Dr. Teresa Ventura entitled Market Empire: The United States the Philippines, and natural resource management. Dr. Ventura came to the library on a fellowship sponsored by the American Council of Learned Societies and the Mellon Foundation. She received her MA and her PhD in history from Columbia University and was awarded that university's Bancroft Dissertation Prize. She is now an assistant professor in the Department of History at Concordia University in Montreal. And her research here at the Library of Congress has helped to give an international aspect to her work. Teresa has been studying how U.S. scientific agriculture, ideas about tropical nature, and colonial politics produced a novel form of development in the early 20th century Philippines. Her fluency in Spanish, as well as her ability in Tagalog, have helped her research here at the Library of Congress. Americans were long eager to form alliances with landowners in the Philippines and to settle agrarian unrest there in order to build commercial exchanges. Today, Dr. Ventura will explore the work of the Philippine Bureaus of Public Land and of Forestry during American occupation and their role in creating an environmental revolution. So thank you to the American Council of Learned Societies for providing a year of funding for postdoctoral research and writing and to the Kluge Center for offering an amazing workspace. I have to thank Carolyn Brown and Mary Lou Reka for inviting me back to speak and Yvonne French for making the arrangements. But I especially want to thank the librarians and staff who brought multiple volumes of the Philippine Journal of Science, the annual yearbooks of the Forestry Service, and the Bureau of Public Lands directly to my desk, which was wonderful. The work that I'll present to you today is largely based on that material, material which, in the history of the tense and tangled relationship between the United States and the Philippines, has been underused but nevertheless tells an important story about empire and the creation of markets, natural resources, and environmental change. When I came to the library to continue my research on U.S.-Philippine relations between the War of 1898 and the establishment of the Philippine Commonwealth in 1936, my questions were threefold. First, how did Americans and Filipinos see and seek to harness nature? Second, how did these visions shape the U.S. occupation of the 7,000 
island archipelago? And third, what was the impact on Philippine land uses, agriculture, and ecological change? In answering these questions, I sought to bring the concerns of historians of science and the environment to bear on the histories of empire and international relations, which meant asking about the ways in which ideas of civilization, science, and development could facilitate cooperation between Americans and Filipinos and contribute to tensions and clashes within these very broad groups. This in turn shed light on two other understudied but important groups who shaped the colonial state. The first were the more than 200 American agricultural scientists, botanists, chemists, and foresters who, along with countless Philippine colleagues, cataloged Philippine nature, attempted to turn its bounty into commodities, and des designated lands for use as agricultural or forest, private or public. The second includes the non-Hispanicized indigenous peoples living throughout the islands, but I'll focus on those mainly in the mountainous regions for whom natural resource management meant the enclosure of their lands and a threat to their livelihoods. This approach to U.S. and Philippine history necessarily begins by integrating the consumption of overseas tropical resources into traditional narratives about the United States' emergence as an industrial world power in the last quarter of the 19th century. For, as Americans were becoming producers of industrial goods, they were also becoming regular consumers of once exotic goods from the Caribbean and the Pacific. You may have had some of these for breakfast today. The banana, the pineapple, and coffee. Tropical fruits are just the most visible manifestation of a trade that included hardwoods, dyes, varnishes, natural rubber, and gutta percha, which lined the undersea's cables connecting the globe. The flow of goods from equatorial regions to North America constitute what the environmental historian Richard Tucker has called the ecological empire. That is, in addition to shrinking politically and geographically, the world also shrunk ecologically. The tastes and desires of consumers as far away as New York, Boston, and London contributed to deforestation and monocrop agriculture in the Caribbean and the Pacific, which in turn provided a fertile breeding ground for crop diseases and ecological degradation. Adding tropical consumption to the history of U.S. foreign relations also adds another solution to an old dilemma for U.S. historians. This is not a problem within Philippine historiography, but for U.S. historians, how to understand the formal annexation and occupation of the Philippines, which, with a population of 8 million people, became the United States' largest overseas territory. Until recently, historians had characterized late 19th century U.S. expansion as driven by a search for markets, uh, markets for American-produced industrial goods. As is well known, the U.S. grew from a rural debtor nation to an industrial powerhouse in the 50-year span between the end of the Civil War and the beginning of the Great War. By 1913, the U.S. produced one-third of the world's industrial output, more than Great Britain, France, and Germany combined. A modern navy secured oceanic trade routes, while diplomatic statements and agreements advanced an open door of free trade in contrast to the formal empires of Europe. Within this narrative, the Philippines occupies, for lack of a better word, a particular place. Its annexation after the U.S. intervention in the Cuban revolutionary struggle precluded the possibility of statehood. It appeared as an arboration and a deviation from what were supposedly American anti-colonial principles. Historians have explained this as, it was a colony acquired in a moment of forgetfulness. The Philippine-American War, which took the lives of 3,000 American soldiers and over 200,000 Filipinos, was a violent reminder that the American people did not actually have a taste for formal imperialism. Much new and excellent work that I won't recount here has thoroughly disputed this view which, as others have noted, tell us very little about why the U.S. stayed in the Philippines beyond the war's official end in 1902, what Americans thought they were doing, what Filipinos wanted, and what actually happened. So including consumption and natural resource management can help to further answer those questions. First, the increased consumption of tropical goods was not a haphazard and unorganized event. It depended upon the labor and knowledge production of agricultural scientists, economic botanists, and foresters who were as important to the continental and overseas expansion of the United States 
as navies and the search for trade routes. These figures did not see their work as an abandonment of an American anti-colonial inheritance. Rather, they believed they were improving nature by bringing useful and unknown goods into the world, a project that would serve American consumers, Filipino growers, small and large, by integrating all into a web of mutually beneficial market relations. Their work from this perspective was combat compatible with agricultural improvement and natural resource management projects in the American West, which provided a training ground for key figures in the American colonial state in the Philippines, as well as with that of Europeans like the British and the Dutch, whose botanical gardens and conservatories in South and Southeast Asia served as an inspiration. For American scientists, annexation of the Philippines was an opportunity to take their work into new environments to enhance their reach and international standing. So the personal and the political were very much entwined. Take, for example, the reaction of David Grandison Fairchild to the prospect of sustained American intervention in the Philippines. In 1898, Fairchild was a plant explorer, someone in search of exotics that could be usefully introduced to American agriculture. He had recently become the head of the USDA's Office of Seed and Plant Introduction. Scarcely a week after U.S. naval forces had routed the Spanish at Manila Bay, Fairchild sent an excited letter to Joseph Beale Steer, a Michigan naturalist who had visited the Philippines twice since the 1870s. Fairchild was familiar with Steer's work, the work of Jesuit botanists in the islands, and with the fact that a collection of Philippine rice varieties had been exhibited at the Paris World's Fair in 1878. As he informed Steer, after spending a year in the Dutch East Indies, Java, and Sumatra, he was alive to the possibilities that there are in the organizing of such colonies if they are properly managed. He continued, he was desirous of ascertaining Steer's opinion regarding the possibilities of these islands. I believe we should hold them and develop them. Fairchild hoped to send a USDA expedition with the army to, quote, gather such information and material, plants, seeds, etc., as would give an idea to the resources of the country. While this formal expedition did not materialize as Fairchild envisioned, something similar did occur. American agricultural scientists traveled with the army and explored the country in the army's wake. Their original task was to locate suitable grasses for the American cavalry, that is, as the U.S. and Philippine cooperation to oust the Spanish from a colony that had waged its own revolutionary independence movement since 1896 turned into warfare between Americans and Filipinos, agricultural scientists materially assisted with the war effort. During the course of the war, more USD experts went to work for the insular government. Their tasks included the identification of local food sources suitable for Americans and, in 1900, to create a Bureau of Agriculture, which was modeled on the USDA. The Bureau was initially headed by Frank Lamson Scribner, an agronomist with the moniker The Grass Doctor, who had experience cultivating, for cultivating grasses for cattle grazing in the American West. The Bureau also hired a very young botanist named Elmer D. Merrill to investigate and catalog plant species in the hopes of finding new and valuable goods for American and world markets. And this could include medicinal plants, food crops, um, a range of, 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 every, of goods that we would now consider every day. Merrill would stay in the Philippines for 21 years, becoming the longest serving administrator in a colonial state notorious for a very high, overturner, uh, high turnover. He oversaw the founding of an agricultural college in Los Banos, Philippines. Back in the United States, he was uh, briefly the head of the New York Botanical Garden and took charge of the Harvard, Harvard's Arnold Arboretum. Um, the Bureau of Agriculture was one of four natural resource management institutions and three of which were headed, like Scribner, by men with extensive experience in resource management in the American West. These other institutions included the Bureaus of Public Lands, Science, and Forestry. All four were located in the Department of the Interior, led by Dean Conant Worcester, 
a Michigan zoologist who had first traveled to the archipelago with Steer, Worcester was a member of the Philippine Commission, an unelected, American-dominated governing body initially led by William Howard Taft. Under Taft, the Commission designed laws to encourage foreign investment in the colony and agricultural exports abroad. How did they do this? Uh, the Bureau of Public Lands sought to facilitate easier land sales and to entice outside investors to lend money to Philippine growers by establishing clear titles for large planters. This Bureau's chief, William B. Tipton, had been a surveyor in the former Spanish territories of Arizona and New Mexico. Tipton, like many others, believed that American lenders would extend cash to planters only if land could be mortgaged, mortgaged which in turn depended on legal titles. His bureau also encouraged small cultivators to apply for legal homesteads up to 40 acres in size. Scholars have interpreted the Philippine homestead law as a sincere, if misguided, effort to make Filipino small uh, to make small farmers out of Filipinos. In actuality, U.S. land law upon annexation declared all, all lands not publicly owned to be private which in turn categorized hundreds of thousands of small cultivators without official titles as squatters. The homestead program would have these small cultivators pay application costs, survey fees, and taxes on lands they had already considered their own in exchange for official state recognition. It was not, as you can imagine, very popular. And the Bureau of Forestry, uh, bore the imprint of Gifford Pinchot, who, as head of a very fledgling U.S. forestry service, was an apostle of scientific conservation in the U.S. Uh, forestry in the U.S. at this time was torn between figures like Pinchot, who believed that management could produce maximum and sustainable timber yields over a very long term, and preservationists, who advocated setting aside certain landscapes for the sake of beauty. In the Philippines, conversationists held the day, pursuing an agenda not yet possible in the United States. Pinchot's former student and Army Lieutenant George Patrick Ahern headed the Forestry Bureau. Ahern's experience, again like Scribner and like Tipton's, was also in the American West. He had, with the Army, mapped forested lands in Montana and designated what is today the boundaries of Glacier National Park. The laws and governing structure of the Forestry Bureau anticipated the establishment of a nationwide and professional forestry service in the U.S. An admirer of the Philippine Forestry Service would call it the finest piece of work the Anglo-Saxon people are trying to do. Just to summarize these, the mission of these bureaus very quickly, it was to first make the Philippines pay for its own administration and therefore prove the profitability of scientific manage, management both abroad and at home. In this mission, experts like Merrill, Tipton, and Ahern were simultaneously aided by an institutional foundation laid by the Spanish and by critics of Spanish colonial rule. So the institutional foundation. Uh, the Spanish bureaucracy opened an Inspección General de Montes in 1862, the first official forestry service in the archipelago. In 1884, an agricultural commission encouraged the founding of experiment farms and distributed its findings to planters through an official bulletin of agriculture. Uh, U.S. experiment stations basically built on top of these older experiment stations. In 1893, the Spanish colonial government declared that all agricultural lands without official title was crown property. Large planters and small cultivators alike had one year to prove their claims. The U.S. built upon this precedent when it declared all non-privately owned lands property of the state. The chiefs of all four bureaus also relied on Philippine assistance to familiarize them with the new landscape. And yet, in all four institutions, uh, Americans disparaged the Spanish past. Um, they, they, and yet, in all four institutions, Americans cast their Spanish predecessors as inefficient and backwards. Uh, Taft, for instance, derided Spanish land reforms as a non-policy that discouraged investment. And I just want to say that for very policy-oriented people, to call something a non-policy was an insult uh, on a magnitude that we can't imagine today. Um, 
on the one hand, why did they do this? Uh, on the one hand, Americans had to intellectually and ideologically distance their work from the Spanish in order to prove to reluctant home audiences and Filipinos that they were not brute imperialists. On the other, their disparagement of the Spanish legacy was assisted by a handful of wealthy Filipinos who, if not quite active revolutionaries in 1896, nonetheless cheered the end of Spanish rule and the beginning of something new. Uh, for example, Ramon Reyes Lala, the son of a wealthy planter family who had been exiled by the Spanish during a crackdown on any revolutionary suspected activity. Uh, Lala studied at Oxford and was living in New York in 1898. He hailed Dewey's naval victory and Manila Bay as an opportunity to, quote, make the glories of my native land better known, using the new, the new U.S. interest in the Philippines to secure a book contract for the Philippine Islands, a political and natural history he had been writing for the past 10 years. He also authored a series of articles in the American press. Lala, though not nearly as well known as revolutionaries and rebels in the Philippines, today to scholars, uh, then positioned himself as a representative figure for American audiences who in turn embraced him, and I'm quoting the US papers here, as a member of the more enlightened classes of the Philippines and a quote, man with a Filipino view of the Filipinos. Like Fairchild and others, Lala believed that greater foreign investment and an increase in trade would improve the situation and standing of the Philippines as a whole. In this, he conflated his personal interests with the interests of the island as a whole. Yet, his views were deeply characteristic of late 19th century liberalism and nationalism in the Philippines and the Spanish-speaking Caribbean as well. Leaders of politically uh, unstable or new nations, such as Honduras, for example, invited U.S. fruit companies to invest in their countries by offering generous land grants with the expectations that these companies uh, would build railroads, which would then help consolidate national rule. International trade, scientific exploration, and agriculture, the taming of wild tropical forests, these were all to lift the nations, these nations in question, uh, in a scale of civilization that equated technological prowess and mechanization with modernity. Liberals like Lala understood his proposed projects as more than profit-driven. They sought to take what was natural and through the application of human skill, turn it into something useful for mankind. They were building nations and developing a citizenry. Anything or anyone that stood in the way of harnessing nature, therefore, stood in the way of civilization itself. It was not necessarily clear to men like Lala, nor should it have been, that outside investors would retain the balance of power in the political histories of these countries. Uh, Lala's representation of Philippine nature in his book and his other writings conveyed his hopes for scientific intervention quite clearly. Um, the Philippines was, as to quote, a botanist's paradise, a region in which an ardent naturalist might browse for years and still have new treasures to find. His 7,000 islands teemed with an amazing tropical growth, he said there were no barren stretches of land, no drought-stricken shores, but instead an abundant rainfall, an equable climate, a rich soil, and the warm influences of equatorial waters. Uh, he exaggerated the forest wealth, saying everywhere is a wealth of trees from the mountains right down to the ocean shore, um, and continued that the people of the Philippine Islands were not wealthy and that Philippine products did not dominate world trade, not because the islands were not inherently uh, naturally wealthy, but because the Spanish looked upon nature with a lazy eye, uh, his quote, and could not be troubled about anything that cannot be put to some immediate use. As a result, the Philippines, Lala continued, may be said to be in a large measure unexplored, waiting for the botanists to discover their treasures the poet to spring their beauties, the practical man to develop their resources. He hoped that a sustained American intervention after 1898 would bring to the Philippines an invasion, as he termed it, 
of three modern classes of enterprise, the scientist, the engineer, and the practical economist. These figures would seek everywhere for what the Philippines have to add to the useful productions of the world. In short, these figures were essential to the transformation of nature into a commodity, to the creation of trade, to the production of wealth. I want to place Lala's image of tropical nature in a wider discursive context. Lala, by blaming the lazy Spanish eye for what we would today call underdevelopment, essentially inverted a much more common view about the relationship between nature and civilization that the scholar David Arnold has coined uh, dubbed tropicality. Splitting the globe into two distinct tropical and temperate zones, this thought held that the inherently fertile lands of the equatorial region allowed inhabitants to lazily cultivate small plots for food, thus precluding the development of more advanced civilizations. The temperate zone in which winter, in which, by contrast, wait, can I just start that over? In the temperate zone? That's good. Winters in the temperate zone, by contrast, stimulated foresight and government. So to some, rich soil made poor people. This discourse of tropicality simultaneously defined and explained difference justified administrative colonialism. Inasmuch as Lala's writing and the work of other Filipino elites attempted to set it aside, Americans were very much steeped in tropicality. The British naturalist Benjamin Kidd, who published The Control of the Tropics in 1898, toured the United States at the same time as Lala. Kidd's tropics, like Lala's, were inherently fertile and waiting for development. Kids' tropical people, unlike Lala's, were incapable of sparking this development without a firm but benevolent Western hand to guide them. To be sure, there are many other significant differences separating Kid and Lala, and also very many subtleties within this discourse. But for the remainder of this talk, I'd like to consider how the idea of a limitlessly fertile tropical nature stacked up against Philippine realities and the effects on policy and people. So to begin with, the Bureau of Agriculture was very slow to realize the reality of food shortages and environmental degradation that had already resulted from a long process of agricultural commercialization. Spain had opened its colony to world trade in the 19th century, and with that, the infusion of merchant capital resulted in regionally specialized monocropping. Estates on the main island of Luzon were worked by tenants who grew a mix of rice, sugar, coconut, and coffee. The island chain of the Biseas housed massive sugar plantations. Uh, hemp harvesting and processing dominated in the Bicol region. Exports passed through Manila, which began its phenomenal growth. Uh, Mindanao, the southernmost island and home to a Muslim majority, remained largely outside of Spanish control, and so I'm not going to talk about it uh, very much right now. I will say that the commercialization dramatically affected the archipelago's 8 million people. Politically, it created a class of Hispanicized landowning elites who commanded peasant labor and soon imagined Catholic lowlanders as belonging to a rightfully independent Philippine nation. This nationalist imagination marginalized non-Christian highlanders, migratory agriculturalists, and Muslims in the South. Environmentally, commercialization resulted in deforestation, soil salination, and a slew of crop and animal diseases, from regular locust outbreaks to a devastating coffee blight in southern Luzon, Rinderpest, which is a cattle plague uh, that swept the globe during this time, reduced stocks of water buffalo, the draft animal of wet rice cultivation, by 85%, and this left once fertile fields fallow. Food shortages interspersed with famine became common. The island of Negros suffered 10 distinct years of famine between 1856 and 1897. Manila's insatiable appetite commanded the peasant staples of chicken and eggs, turning them into valuable commodities. 
By 1877, the colony regularly imported mechanically milled rice from Burma and Vietnam. So here we have this, you know, very rich nation or archipelago that, that doesn't actually produce enough food for its own population. These food shortages and global trade had a tremendous impact on Philippine health contributed to the revolution in 1896 and also shaped the resistance to the American occupation. From the perspective of health, uh, for example, mechanical rice milling removed a very thiamine-rich skin from the rice husk, which resulted in the loss of B-complex vitamins. An extreme thiamine deprivation contributed to a disease called polyneuritis, which is a painful, debilitating, and sometimes fatal edema in the lower limbs, popularly known as beriberi. The endemic deficiency at this time may have contributed to an infant mortality rate in Manila of 50% in the 1890s. So elites defined nationalism as, as greater participation in international trade, or where one aspect of an elite definition of nationalism was participation in this greater trade, revolutionary independence, as others have looked at, uh, revolutionary peasants understood independence from Spain, Calayaan, as a return to a past where food was not scarce, where prices were not high, and where land was abundant. Many rank and file peasant fighters anticipated broad economic and social changes after the revolution and were sorely disappointed in the short-lived Philippine Republic's policy of reinstituting commercial agriculture prior to the reestablishment, very briefly, of Spanish rule. American forces in 1898 simply exasperated these problems. American forces burned fields, halted the inter-island food trade. Uh, reports of soldiers in Cuba sickened by tinned, beet, by tinned meat from Chicago, what was known as the embalmed food scandal, forced the commissary to command your lo scarce local meats. Southwestern Luzon, uh, which had been host to the fiercest and most prolonged fighting, had been completely cut off from food supplies and not coincidentally surrendered at the start of the planting season in 1902. Post-war U.S. alliances with landowners resulted in the support for the reconstruction of commercial ag agriculture. The effect was um, to increase rice importation and depress incomes for remaining small rice farmers. The Bureau of Agriculture was eager to prove its legitimacy to the large planters, those it considered the best men of the Philippines, and devoted less attention to food crops in favor of improving sugar cultivation and milling processes. To the extent that Americans looked at food crops during this time, it was really in search for tropical fruits that could sort of, they could sell in the United States, uh, akin to the banana. So uh, imagine if, you know, instead of a banana this morning, you had a chico or a mangosteen, uh, fruits that are incidentally coming back now as uh, superfoods. The Bureau also invested its scarce resources in the development of coconut plantations in southern Luzon and rubber plantations on Mindanao. Uh, coconuts were not strictly a food resource. French agricultural experiment stations in, in Africa had revealed that co coconuts could be processed to produce nitroglycerin. The Bureau of Science in the Philippines joined this effort, studying the internal properties of coconuts and the ideal land and spacing dimensions for coconut plantations because these coconuts could be used to make dynamite, it could be used as weapons of war. Uh, the Bureau of Agriculture did not pay serious attention to the food needs of the island until dual tragedies in 1902 brought famine, uh, the first being a drought, the second being the eruption of Ta'al Volcano in southern Luzon. Um, so there was uh, a rather small but nonetheless significant famine, which resulted in the rising cost of food prices and widespread labor unrest in Manila during this time. Even then, 
the Bureau did not quite approach the problem in a way that devoted more land to food crops. Rather, it suggested planting land to corn, uh, planting rice land to corn, a food they thought was more healthful and also a food that could be grown annually. Corn, which had been grown in the Philippines for hundreds of years, was to many not fit for human consumption. It was animal fodder. This in turn sparked a massive corn campaign, which was run on rather militaristic lines. It blended agricultural education with dietary reforms, held corn growing contests in the schools, uh, food demonstrations, um, and yet it did not really make much of an impact on, on the everyday diets of Filipinos. So that's one way in which the Bureau of Agriculture dealt or was forced to deal with the reality of Philippine uh, environmental limitations. The f Turning real quickly to the bureaus of public lands and forestry is another way of looking at sort of the expectations versus the realities. First, the virginal forests that Americans anticipated were actually home to very ethnically and linguistically diverse peoples who had eluded lowland and Spanish control. Americans uh, cast these people into two very broad groups, the first called Negrito and the second called the Igorot which referred to the extremely diverse peoples of the mountain province of Luzon. This is the Cordillera mountain area. Um, some of these agricultural practices of these people were migratory. They mixed the controlled burning of lands for pasture, a process called Cayenian, which after a few seasons were returned to forest. Upland migrant mountain agriculture combined the growing of taro and sweet potatoes in common forest lands with the harvesting of wet rice in privately owned plots on steeply terraced mountains. While Americans marveled at the technological prowess that went into designing and building the terraces, these Negritos and Igorotes still represented the least civilized people in the Philippines from the American perspective. Um, and so therefore, their land uses were not seen as legitimate. Uh, Ahern of the Forestry Bureau believed that clearing with fire destroyed valuable timber. He thought it was irresponsible. He even called it a, an evil. Uh, Ahern lambasted Cayunion as the most destructive agency in the Philippine forests. You can scroll. He empowered his forest officers to make arrests to impose fines, but then lamented that his measures failed to accomplish the desired results, because essentially policing a forest is a tremendous task. With the assistance of the Philippine Lumbermen's Association, he began an education campaign to try to encourage the influential of the people to see Cayenian as, as an evil and to, you know, in, ask them to, uh, practice conservation of their resources. Uh, so again, his campaign against Cayenian was waged in the name of conservation and efficient management. But what his forestry service essentially accomplished or sought to do was to transfer the rights to the forests from non-Christians and from small cultivators to commercial lumber interests. These large lumbering interests, incidentally, had a much greater capacity to enact a swift deforestation than small producers combined. And this is precisely what happened rapidly in the last half of the 20th century. The bureaus of forestry, public lands and agriculture together, unintentionally increased small cultivators' reliance on forest resources. The loss of agricultural lands, food shortages, and the displacement of squatters led countless small cultivators to turn to the forests for foraging, firewood, and planting, um, which was accomplished most swiftly with controlled fire. It soon became impossible for the Forestry Bureau to distinguish between wild Cayunian makers and displaced lowland farmers who would be required to make formal applications for homesteads on lands they were suspected of burning. Thus, U.S. policies 
grounded in the belief that scientific agriculture and management would result in efficient land use, essentially encouraged what appeared to Ahern's Bureau as a chaos of uses. The immediate reaction on the part of the Bureau of Forestry was to seek greater aid for the enforcement and punishment of squatters in the forest and to call for the indefinite extension of American rule in the islands in the name of conservation. So American land law, land law and these policies were, I think, indisputably disruptive in its unintended consequences. But these unintended consequences could also work in very surprising ways. So I don't want to end the talk on a very sour note. Uh, so we'll consider one of these surprising unintended consequences um, in the case of what is now known in Filipino law and land rights circles as the Carino Doctrine. The Philippine Commission had identified a swath of land in Mountain Province as the ideal temperate location for a summer capital and set about building the city today called Baguio. Land in and around Baguio was part of an extensive ranch owned by the Ibaloy chief, Mateo Carino, who sued the insular government. An American judge in the Philippines found Carino's claims to the land void, as he did not possess a legal title recognized by law. Carino's case was just one of three challenging the American ability to decide between proper and therefore valid land titles. His case, however, was the only one to go before the American Supreme Court. The U.S. colonial government, after disparaging land law, uh, after disparaging Spanish land law, had essentially argued that Carino failed to gain legal title as per those 1893 Spanish degrees to decrees discussed earlier. His land, they held, had legally reverted to the crown and hence to the U.S. with the transfer of sovereignty. Carino instead argued that he had prior, quote, vested rights based on his family use. In 1909, the Supreme Court decided in Carino's favor. Oliver Wendell Holmes wrote in the majority opinion that to deny Carino's claim was a violation of the 1902 Organic Act for the Philippines, which declared, quote, no law shall be enacted which shall deprive any person of life, property, life, liberty, or property without due process of law. Or of law. The court essentially refused to declare unhispanicized Filipinos as squatters on their own land, recognizing vested rights. American laws, which favored private owners, became, in the hands of this Ibaloy man, a very powerful tool for the protection of indigenous land rights, despite the intent of the law's founders to promote commercial development. This Carino doctrine did not have a widespread and immediate impact until the 1970s and 1980s, when human rights lawyers resuscitated it, uh, and they're the ones who are now calling it the Carino doctrine. Um, and it's, you know, I guess, ironic then that American law is now used to make a case for the protection of ancestral land rights. So to conclude, I confess that I'm still in the process of answering many of the questions I raised at the beginning of this talk, but I hope that I have shown that the drive for overseas markets at the end of the 19th century was equally and also about developing tropical goods for sale in American markets. This work was materially assisted by the knowledge and skill of agricultural scientists, foresters, and botanists who saw empire as a chance to enhance their reach and expertise. Some Filipinos for whom liberalism and nationalism were entwined with greater world trade welcomed this work, if not the violent war of which it was a part. Yet the development promised by scientific management and conservation for many others was destructive. Within this historical dynamic um, and in this contest over the meaning of development and the designation of proper land uses, I think we can recognize the outlines of some very contemporary problems and hopefully devise better solutions. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.